I am Parni Jaggi and in this lecture we are going to be discussing a very sweet and beautiful poem by John Donne, The Canonization. Now as we have already witnessed, the poetry of John Donne is basically metaphysical although it deals with the emotion, with the subject of love more often. But here, when we talk about canonization, we find a different plane, a different level of love. Although he has dealt with different moods of love in all his poems and has played with its several facets, fancies and visions. However, in this poem, he's taken a very serious view of love and a kind of a saintly affection, a saintly touch to the emotion of love. So we see the poem The Canonization was first published in 1633 in his posthumous collection Songs and Sonnets. Now when we look at the poem we find that the tone of the poem is basically rhetorical. It, it begins like a rhetoric as if he is again scolding somebody and he is kind of challenging the vision, the the philosophy, the mentality of the world to look at him and his love which he is convinced shall achieve the status of sainthood through love. So when we look at the title of the poem, the canonization, we define canonization as achieving a specific status which is higher than the other things. So here it is about love, achieving the status of sainthood through love. So this is what he talks about in canonization. So let's look at the poem. He says, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Now this is supposedly to anybody he's talking, maybe to a friend, to an associate or to the world at large. He says, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Now this is purely rhetorical. He's trying to scold somebody because he says himself that the, his, his own love is harmless. So let me love, or chide my palsy, O oh my gout, my five grey hairs, or ruined fortune flout. Fortune flout, we find alliteration here. Now these are instances, examples. He says, you better keep your mouth shut and let me love, just as it is useless, it is futile to rebuke or chide the poet from suffering from diseases like gout or paralysis or other infirmities like misfortune or five grey hairs means old age. In the same way, it is futile for him to try to dissuade him from making love. So the ultimate goal of the poet is to make love. So he kind of pleads the world to stop disturbing him from making love. With wealth your state, your mind with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place, observe his honour or his grace, or the king's real or his stamped face. Contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me love. So this is what he advises to the people around. Instead of disturbing me, advising me, wasting your time on me, it would be better if you go and improve your own prospects of wealth in your mind, improve your mind, cultivate your mind, go and acquire more knowledge, develop a taste for arts and improve your mind. Then you may undertake some course, you may secure a place or a position. Now in those times we used to have the king's court and the most important positions used to be in the court of the king. So he says it's better that you go and try to occupy honor or place or status in the court of the king. Because as a courtier, king's real or his stamp face, you will have the opportunity to look at the king, to have uh, the, the um, live interaction with the king or even his stamp face means the coin, wealth, you would be wealthy. So go and contemplate, go and think about all these things and just let me love. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? Now he picks up another point. He says, whom am I harming? Whom am I disturbing? 
who is injured by my love? What merchant's ships of my sighs drowned, who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my coals of forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plague bill? So these are questions, but he is questioning the world. Have I harmed any one of you? Have I done something which has disturbed the flow of the world? Have my sighs drowned any merchant's ships? Have my tears caused any floods? Have the coldness of my fears prolonged the winter season? Now these are examples of hyperbole. He's exaggerating the point that he wants to make. He says, I have not delayed the advent of the spring season. Forward spring remove. I have not forwarded the spring season. I have not um, kind of lengthened the winter season. And my heat, the heat of my love or passion has not added any more to the list of people who have died of plague. So I am not responsible for any kinds of deaths. Soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels move though she and I do love. So he says the world is still going on in its cycle. The soldiers still have their jobs continuing to fight the wars and the lawyers are still busy in their litigations. They still have cases to fight. So in spite of my love, he says, the world cycle goes on in its pace. Though she and I do love. Since we are busy in love making, we are in true love, we are not disturbing anybody. So let not the world also disturb us. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me another fly. Now this is a very important passage in more than one way. One, because it has a number of metaphysical conceits which are very important and which are also the attractions of his poetry. And second, the kind of intensity and depth of love he shows in this passage is exemplary, is beautiful. So he says, you may call us what you want to. We are made such by love. Whatever we are, we are by love. You may think whatever you want to about us. Call her one, me another fly. You may call us flies. You may think that we are flies. She is one fly and I am another fly. It is like we are chasing the light. The flies chase light. We are tapers too and at our own cost die. Now tapers are candles. So he is comparing the two lovers to candles. He says, now here candle means devotion. It burns in self to give out light to the world. He says our love is devotion. We are devoted to an, each another and we burn ourselves in mutual love. But we are not concerned. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. Now eagle and the dove are two birds which signify reverse roles. Because eagle is a violent bird and dove is a gentle Bird. So both, one is peaceful, the other is violent. He says we are a combination of both. We are reverse roles. So this is another metaphysical conceit beautifully expressed which gives us the in-depth status of their love. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. We too being one are it. So to one neutral thing both sexes fit. We die and rise the same and prove mysterious by love. Now this is another very popular simile or uh, metaphysical conceit which is used by Dunn. He says the legend of the phoenix you all must be knowing. The phoenix is a bird which is mythological bird but it is well known for its being a singular creature which dies after 500 years and then is reborn. It comes to life again from the same ashes. It is unisexual. So that means it has nothing to look around. It is so independent. Like the mystery of the phoenix, he says, the mystery of our love will also ask for respect. People will look at us mysteriously, but will also respect us. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hears, our legend be, it will be fit for worse. Now here another concept is being introduced. He says, if we lovers, K 
cannot live by love peacefully, happily, if the world is disturbing us all the time, then we can die by it. We can die by it and if our story is not worthy of monuments or tombs, then of course it will be worthy for verse. Verse here means poetry, sonnets, lyrics. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we will build in sonnets pretty room. So he says, even if we are not recorded, in the immortal volumes of history, in the records of history, it will certainly find the most respectable place mentioned in sonnets, poetry, lyrics, verse. As well a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs, and by these hymns all shall approve us canonized for love. So he says, just as the ashes of great people, they are kept safely preserved in an ornamental tomb or urns covering just half an acre of the area in the same way we will be respected by the world as saints as canonized lover we will be canonized due to love for love as lovers and thus invoke us you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage you to whom love was peace that now is rage who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of her eyes, so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize countries, towns, courts, beg from above a pattern of your love. So he says, thus people will invoke us, people will pray in the presence of our pictures or our, of our memories that you, now this is in quotation, Quotation marks means that he is kind of quoting or citing the people's words that after they die as lovers, people may quote them, people may say like them, people may invoke them just as they invoke gods and saints and they may say that you, you were the saints of love and you made each other the hermitage, the pilgrimage, you were the teeth for each other. You were so deeply in love. And for others, people may be, uh, love may be a passion, but for you, for you, it is like peace, it is like blissfulness, it is a blessing. Why? Because the whole world's soul contracted in you and drove into the glasses of your eyes. That means you always saw the reflection of the entire world in each other's eyes. That means the whole world was contracted just in your eyes. You saw the entire cosmos, the entire universe. Your love was so intense. So, countries, towns, courts beg from above a pattern of your love. So, you will be an example to set a pattern for the world that this is how love should be and this is how lovers should be. This is what John Donne has to say about canonized love where he thinks that he would be raised to a platform of saints as lovers. Now we know the theme of the poem is love, love and love but love in the metaphysical form and he is quite optimistic, quite positive and quite serious about the repercussions of love that might, he, that might be seen in the present world as well as after death after he dies and the world looks upon him as gods or deities or saints. Now we see the style and structure of the poem is such, <clears throat> it is full of metaphysical conceits. We find no dearth of metaphysical conceits. We see that he uses candles, phoenix, eagle and dove, all these riddles and all these examples which are rich metaphysical conceits and make us wonder as to how he compares his love to these. Now when we talk about the structure, it is a five stanza poem which is separated into sets of nine lines each and uh, there is a uniformity of the pattern of A, B, B, A, C, 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 A, A. And uh, when we look at the meter, Dunn was not very consistent with the meter but usually he is using iambic pentameter. Um, now at places there is a use of iambic tetrameter also, but uh, usually he is using, we also have trimeter, but then we need not uh, actually 
go confused because of his meter because what matters here is the theme and the intensity of love and the use of the extended metaphors which are the conceits in this poem particularly so i feel it's it's a beautifully brought out poem which has again a double reference to the death which can be a death of uh, the physical relationship also but it can be death in the real sense also after which the lovers will be raised to a saintliness to a saintly status which he calls the canonization so stay tuned for the next videos in john dan thank you for now